From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Coming up today, K-State's Greg Hanselcheck will discuss the treatment and prevention of scour's disease in newborn beef calves. The emphasis, says Greg, on responding with fluid treatments as opposed to relying heavily on antibiotics. We've also for you today excerpts from the latest Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State. This time, Brad White, Bob Larson, Bob Weber, and Dustin Pendle take up two cow herd topics, evaluating breeding stock for docility, and some herd management things to keep in mind as even harsher winter weather is settling into the area in the coming days. And awaiting with another Stop, Look, and Listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven along with more here on Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Glad to have you tuned in for another Agriculture Today on this, the K-State Radio Network. It's our opportunity once more to visit about what's happening in the field of bovine health management. Along our way once again, as he joins us regularly, is Greg Hanselcheck. Greg, to remind you, is the director of the Production Animal Field Investigations Unit for the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here at Kansas State University. Greg, we're going to bring up a topic that's all too familiar to our cow-calf producers out there, scour's disease in calves. The more formal reference is neonatal diarrhea, but they're one and the same. Exactly. We like scours better. It's just simpler, but you're, you're right. It, we have to talk about it every year. It's the most common or one of the most common diseases in baby calves and cow-calf operations, especially spring calving operations. It'd be nice if we could prevent it all and quit talking about it, but we probably never are. So it's just important that we we talk about at least once a year. And you have numbers that show the magnitude of the problem around, right? Absolutely. It's it's the in the top three of the reasons why calves that are born alive on in spring calving herds die before weaning is, is because of scours. And up to twenty percent of all the calves that are actually lost from birth to to weaning are, are due to scour. So it's a, it's an important disease. And that means it translates into a costly disease to producers, without question. It does, and it's not only the loss of the calves, but there's some really good research out there that show that calves that suffer scours, uh, at least one experience of it, that, that decreases their productivity even if they survive. So it's probably it lasts longer than, than we actually think. Well, some background on the condition. One thing you remind us is that this is a universal problem or can be in virtually all herds. The potential is there anyway. Absolutely. The organisms that we talk about that cause scars, there's two viruses, rodent and corona, there's two bacteria, E. coli and salmonella, and then there's an organism that, that's not either one. It's a protozoa called crypto, and all of those organisms are on every operation except for probably salmonella. So we're never going to get away from the exposure of the organisms to the calf. We've, we've got to remember that up uh, front. So there are multiple possibilities here, but you note, Greg, that part of the problem in contending with this disease is that they can work independently or they can work in tandem in a number of combinations here. Absolutely. And we just finished uh, summarizing last year's uh, results from scour diagnostics that we did in the in the diagnostic lab and several thousand tests. You know, we talked about those organisms. Forty eight percent of all the cases that we looked at actually were a combination. They were not a single rota or corona or E. coli. They were a combination of a virus, protozoa, a couple viruses. So it's a more complex disease and and more complex interaction between these organisms than 
than we like to believe sometimes. So nearly half of the incidents are, in fact, a combination of two or more of these bugs, if you will. Absolutely. 48% were a combination. They were not single organisms that we found in these uh, in these calves. So how does that affect the diagnostic process then? It, it must make it more difficult to sort out what's going on, doesn't it? Well, in the past, we would say that that's true because of the, uh, the type of testing. But today, we actually have molecular diagnostics. So we can, we've got one, what we call a panel, and it looks for the DNA. And it doesn't have to be, these organisms do not have to be alive. And the test is just looking for little pieces of the DNA for each one of these organisms. So it's very, very sensitive, meaning if you just have a few organisms in there, that test is is going to be positive for those. So you can pin them down, but that in turn means the treatment can be more complicated, does it not? Well, the treatment is going to be the same for anything, any of our scour organisms. It's going to be fluids, fluids, fluids. And we like to go with oral fluids first because we don't want to be putting calves in IV fluids. But it's fluids, but there may be times where an antibiotic is appropriate if we've got two of the bacteria that are involved in, in scours present in those feces. But producers will think antibiotics first, and they need to think the fluid intake first, is what you're saying here. Absolutely. The veterinary profession, we've done a really good job of uh, telling producers, talk to them about antibiotics, use antibiotics. Antibiotics may be appropriate, but those are secondary. It's oral fluids, and it's uh, the proper amount of fluids, and it's also the selecting the proper electrolyte solution to mix with that water to to give those calves orally. Let's get into that a bit, if we might. How does one make the right call on that appropriate fluid to treat the scours outbreak that they have in their herd? Well, if we've got a calf that, well, let me back up. Mm -hmm. These calves die from dehydration, and so that's why we have to concentrate on fluids. So if we've got a calf that that we know needs some oral fluids, really the minimum amount is two quarts twice a day. And all of our electrolyte solutions are produced to mix with two quarts of water. But a lot of producers think that maybe just one dose once a day is enough. And usually it's not. It's at least two quarts twice a day. And for some of these cases, it's going to take three to four oral, uh, two-quart oral doses of that fluid to get those calves over that dehydration. You can't really overdose the electrolytes. If it's excess, the calf is just going to urinate the excess fluids. And we're fine with that. But you don't want to underdose those calves. Greg, you also say that not all electrolytes are created equal in the marketplace. It's amazing on how many products are out there. I think there's 30 or 40 that are available in the United States, and some really good research by some people in North Carolina State have shown that only about four or five, maybe at the most, are actually contain the ingredients that are going to help these calves as they go through this dehydration and this acidosis. So I wouldn't just go to the local co-op and pick the, the cheapest electrolyte. I would go to the local veterinarian and say, what's the best electrolyte I can use to, to treat my calves? Now, the preference would be to minimize, if not prevent, and, and prevention is awfully difficult, but at least minimize the outbreak of scours. And that gets back to the calving site and cleanliness more times than not, doesn't it? Absolutely. If, if there's a scour outbreak, the first step that a producer can do, if possible, to stop the outbreak is to move anybody that hasn't calved onto clean ground. If they're doing it in a dry lot situation, then scraping out the pen. Whatever you can do to reduce the amount of manure that is exposed to those baby calves, a lot of times will stop the scour outbreak. If at all possible, find a grassy area someplace. Absolutely. The biggest uh, area that's, it can be dry lot, but grass is better. Anything that's large that just keeps the adult manure from building up and those calves exposed to it, that, that's really the key to, to preventing scours. Now, we talk about these various bugs that can cause scours, be it a virus, be it a bacteria, a protozoa. Are there any human health consequences in as far as coming in contact with these? Absolutely. And that's, we talked about the treatment's going to be the same for all these organisms. One of the reasons why we promote uh, diagnostics being completed on these calves is to find out, do we have predominant uh, two organisms that cause disease in humans, which is the salmonella and the crypto? Because if it's there as the most likely organism, 
then special care about hand sanitation, clothes sanitation. We can talk to the producer about that and say, we need to be extra careful when we're around those calves. If one does come in contact, simply cleaning up as soon as possible. That's the best bet. Absolutely. We recommend wearing gloves anytime that we're handling these baby calves. Uh, Do not take the clothes into the house because we can transmit it to the the kids that are in the house. The clothes, we're dealing with scouring calves, the clothes stay outside. We, We handle everything in an appropriate manner so that we're not spreading these organisms to other people in the household. So keep that well in mind, something that is often overlooked in the hustle and bustle of the the normal calving season. Regrettably, Greg, we can't get rid of these complexes in our calving herds, but it's a, a matter of minimizing as much as one can. Again, fluids, do antibiotics come into play at all at any time? They probably do, and but that's really up to the the local veterinarian or the producer's veterinarian to decide that there's there's times where probably antibiotics are appropriate but that's not the mainstay we have to concentrate on again the appropriate amount and uh, quality of the electrolytes and the fluids that we're giving those baby calves it still comes back to that standard message we seem to share every time we visit and that is consult your local veterinarian if you have a scours outbreak get a hold of that individual as soon as possible get them involved in the response Absolutely. They're, they're going to be your best source of information and, and guidance for treatment, prevention, for all these things that we talked about today. Well, the spring calving season has already commenced for a number of our cow-calf operators. The bulk of that activity will gin up here pretty quickly throughout the next several weeks. So producers, take heed and do what you can to minimize the calf health issues and even losses at the hands of neonatal diarrhea, also known as scours. And Greg, many thanks to you as always for the input. He is Greg Hanselcheck from the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here at Kansas State University. And you can contact that laboratory for more information on this health condition or other issues concerning your herd health and management at this simple web address, ksvdl.org for Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory, ksvdl.org. After the break, we'll bring you excerpts from the latest Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University. That's next here on Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. We're back with Agriculture Today. This is Britton Rucker. Coming to you from the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University is another BCI Cattle Chat. Participating in this week's podcast are veterinarians Brad White and Bob Larson. Also joining them are livestock economist Dustin Pendle and cow-calf specialist Bob Weber. Brad tells us here the topics they'll be focusing on this time around. So as as we think about today's podcast, we're going to talk about a couple of different things. We're going to talk about docility, talk also a little bit about cold weather, how to manage that. To jump in, docility, and and maybe Bob, you can tell us genetics-wise or as we think about planning for our herd, how big of a role does docility play when you're making culling decisions, either on the adults or, let's say, replacement heifers? You know, as we think about docility or temperament, it's another way to describe how, how an animal behaves. Genetics, we try and define the situation under which they behave, so it's uniform across herds as much as we can. And uh, a frequent strategy is to use a, a system called shoot score, so it's basically a categorical scoring system that describes how they behave when they have just their head restrained in a squeeze shoot. So do they just stand there? Do they flick their tail? You know, the 
low numbers are desirable. So ones and twos typically are the ones that we like to, to see. They're they're pretty docile. You know, the five and six ones, they're testing every weld. And it's been a while since I've read the uh, categories, but fours are particularly unpleasant. Fives are really unpleasant. A six is kind of one that you let out of the chute and you comes back at you. So yeah, yeah it's um, surprisingly heritable though. There's there's some other other measurements of chute score, like pen score, for example, is another one where you take three or four or five animals and put them in a I, I can use the one powder river by two powder river panel. So 12 by 24 is the dimension of that pen. Approach them and score that it's a one to five system. You want to wear athletic footwear when you do that because if you need to get away from them. But heritabilities of both those shoot score and pin score typically is in somewhere in the midpoint threes. So that's, that's as good as yearling weight. And so you can make pretty dramatic change in behavior of animals and their responsiveness to humans in a pretty short period of time by selection. So. And are those scores in a pen or in the shoot? Is that indicative of how they'd behave in other environments? And is it repeatable? Because there's um, some days good days, some days bad days. Yeah, it's pretty repeatable. Somewhere typically in the point sixes, So fairly, fairly repeatable. And generally, since you've already put the if shoot score, for example, you've already put the animal in a pretty stressful situation. So close proximity to humans. So if they're going to be a bad actor, that's a, a pretty good place to find them. I happen to like pen score a little bit just because it, it's kind of the responsiveness just in a pen setting, so you don't have the squeeze shoot part. It takes more time to score, and it's a little bit affected by kind of the, the animal's cohort that's in there. I should so. say it'd be affected by that because one that's yeah. a little bit excitable makes everybody else, if they yeah. were on the border, a little more yeah. excitable. Yeah. yeah. I think we can think of, you know, offspring of certain bulls or cow families that we've had more trouble with trying to be a little bit aggressive. And so I'm not surprised that there's a pretty strong genetic component. But but then I also see some differences as a veterinarian going from ranch to ranch. And, and yeah, there'll be there'll be different genetics on different ranches, but also there's different people. Right. So there's got to be a human component to Yeah, that. surely there is. And there wasn't the heritability B1, right? So yeah. the, the interaction... Going through that environment. Yeah. And, and that's another reason sometimes it's, it's important to do those animals fairly young in life. So you can think about maybe some old grouchy cow she might not have been that way three years ago until somebody got really mad at her and so helped with, induce that sort of behavior so with a pretty good genetic component to it i assume then are you telling me that i can make a difference in my herd by selecting for that for a couple of generations and really see a difference yeah you can really see a difference and you know most of the major breed associations now have docility epds available and there's a pretty big spread in in the bulls even in breeds that you wouldn't typically think of as, of having a disposition problem mm-hmm. so you know kind of keeping that as is one of the criteria, particularly as we think about bulls for building replacement females, for example, paying attention to docilities, it's it's definitely worth the effort. What, so. what about correlations with other factors? Like, is it correlated with am I performance? Yeah, yeah, am I, I going to um, like Phenotypically, there's not a lot of, of genetic correlation data, a little bit, but it, it's, it's not a bunch. But phenotypically, so when I was at Mizzou, we did some work on uh, tracking a group of calves from weaning time clear to harvest, including feed efficiency and feed intake data in a grow safe system. So we had a backgrounding period, a weaning point that they were scored, a, a 56 day backgrounding period, and then they went on feed. And one of the things we found is that the cattle that went into the receiving or backgrounding period that had better either pen scores or shoot scores, or if you want to capture an objective measurement, we use flight time or flight speed, so how fast they left the chute. The the docile group had uh, statistically significant better average daily gains than the, the wild ones, and so we kind of divided them up in thirds. And so that was that was interesting. When you put the cattle on feed, the docile ones, they went into the feed yard heavier. They gained more during the backgrounding period, but they were also more feed efficient well, that's uh, during nice the feeding now, period. Now I can get two things that I want. I, I want more docile cattle yep. as well as some better performance and at least they're not hurting each other yeah and one, one of the things we thought was interesting and may have been partially an artifact of the, the feed setting that we were in but it was a set of small group pens um, so there'd be 20 to 50 head per pen for those uh, grow safe nodes and we, we phenotyped the cattle every two weeks so we could get our repeatability measurements one of the things we noticed was the, the cattle that were really bad so the fours and fives for the pen scores those cattle typically didn't get better during the feed the Period. The ones that were really excitable. The really excitable ones. And if you went and watched when they were doing a feeding event, those cattle, as soon as the feed truck comes up to, to the feed bunk, those cattle would go stand at the back of the pen. And they would get back to the feed bunk about the time the truck came back by again to feed the next pen over. So, you know, it's 
traffic and activity around the feed yard really disrupted their kind of feeding behavior, it seemed. And So um, it wasn't just the people. It was the cattle in the pen, everything else yeah, going on. Yeah, all and, kinds of stuff going yeah. on. And, and I thought it was interesting, you know, we tried to have really good stockmanship, handle those those animals consistently. But they're the, flighty. The bad ones just stay bad, is our experience. And, so. I, and I think that that's a great point. And, and that's why we can manage it as something in our herd. So this is something with a heritability, and you said similar to yearling weight, the point yep. three yep. of docility. It's something that you can build in over time in your herd and you have some control over. Yeah. But also, to your point, um, managing that environment, making sure it's as low stress as possible. Because if they have a bad event, they may not get better. So it, get better. it, it yeah. can be cumulative. One so of the things that's really interesting, too, is if you look at the – keep track of the serial order that animals go through processing and you, as you handle them repeatedly. You'll find if you go get a big group of animals or draft from a big group um, – they have a tendency to kind of aggregate about the same way. And the interesting thing is what's left in the pen at the end is really two different phenotypes. One is the really docile ones that they've been pushed around all day by their friends. The other one's the really crazy ones. Yeah. And so, you know, kind of maybe keep track a little bit as you think about as you're working, say, weaned heifers. You know, those last 20 maybe that go through out of 100 – Kind of pay Watch attention them. to what who they are, and, and, yeah, that can have an impact. So One of the other things we want to address today was talk a little bit about preparations for colder weather and a, and a couple things to think about there, making sure our barns, everything are ready to go, as well as the water. And, Bob, you had a couple comments. You know, it, it is January, and so, you know, some of the things that I commonly come up in our lives anyway is water sources and planning ahead, making sure that, that you're, you're ready for keeping the the ice off of, of water sources and just making sure the cows and calves are in pretty good body condition because cold weather is hard on a thin animal particularly so make sure the body condition is good and if you're going to start calving that first 24 hours of life that calf is born wet hasn't had a belly full of warm milk yet or anything like that he's at pretty high risk for cold stress if he's born in a cold particularly wet environment and so really watching those early those calves during their first day of life to, to make sure that they, they can get warmed up and get ready to go. In addition to water, you know, we, in the cold weather, you got space heaters, heat lamps, thinking about fires. And so that's something else you got to think it, about. Is, it does seem like yeah. this is the time of year when you'll you'll hear it about an occasional barn fire or shed fire or something like that set up by, exactly, I'm trying to warm up calves or I'm trying to keep something else so, warm. So you just keep that in mind where, they're, where you're setting things nearby, a, a space heater, heat lamp, and... On a, on a well, shelf, so, sometimes it's too the it's we're starting to use that stuff but we're using an electrical circuit we haven't used since last year and we didn't notice that some rodent had chewed through the wire and so we flip the switch on nothing happens right away we walk away and you know at midnight the barn burns down because it's got an electrical short or, which, or extension yeah. cords extension i mean cords it's never too. right next to where you need it to be and so, right. again i think maybe take home is we know it's january and so right here around manhattan the weather has been pretty good the last few days it's it's good to kind of address these things as much as possible ahead of time. Yep, absolutely. So preventative plan, be sure we test all those out and be safe with being sure that animals have water as well as maintaining the electricity. We appreciate you joining us today. As always, if you have questions or you have anything you'd like us to talk about, email us at bci at ksu.edu. And we look forward to seeing probably several of you. Most of us will be at NCBA here in a couple of weeks, so we'll, we'll be able to see you there. Yep, look forward to it. From the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University, that was Brad White, Bob Larson, Dustin Pendle, and Bob Weber. Be sure to hear the entire podcast at beefcattleinstitute.org. Again, that is beefcattleinstitute.org. When we come back, Eric will have the agricultural headlines and more. For Ag Today, this is Britton Rucker, and we'll be back with more after the break over the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station.
From the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and welcome back. Now, today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy, in part, of DTN. U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer did not see any progress made on structural issues during the trade talks with China last week in Beijing. That's according to Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa as he met with Lighthizer last week. However, Grassley said that Lighthizer commented very positively in that meeting on Friday on China's soybean purchases, which resumed a month after Washington and Beijing agreed to a 90-day truce in the trade war that has disrupted the flow of hundreds of billions of dollars of goods. Quoting here Grassley, Lighthizer said that there hasn't been any progress made on structural changes that need to be made, although he added that those issues would include intellectual property, stealing trade secrets, and putting pressure on corporations to share information. The two sides are trying to reach a deal that avoids a scheduled March the 2nd escalation of U.S. tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese goods. Grassley said Chinese officials were scheduled to visit Washington for further trade talks at the end of this month. The USDA has stepped up its efforts to prevent African swine fever from entering the U.S. While this disease continues to be a significant problem in other countries, the USDA is implementing safeguards to prevent it from showing up here. Todd Domer has more. Chinese officials continue to deal with an outbreak of African swine fever. Numerous cases have been confirmed in China since the initial discovery in August. According to USDA, the disease also is spreading within the European Union, reaching 10 member states and affecting mostly wild pig populations. Despite never being found in North America, USDA is increasing its vigilance and safeguarding efforts against the introduction of the disease into the U.S. Imports of pork and pork products from affected countries are being restricted, USDA also is working with port of entry officials to increase passenger and baggage screening for prohibited products from affected countries. At the farm level, USDA is collaborating with states, the pork (coughs) industry, and producers to ensure biosecurity and best practices are followed. African swine fever is a virus spread by contact with body fluids from infected animals. Although it doesn't affect humans, People can be carriers of the virus, as can ticks. It can be spread by feeding pigs uncooked garbage containing infected pork products. Symptoms in hogs include high fever, decreased appetite, weakness, discolored skin, coughing, and difficulty breathing. Producers or veterinarians should immediately report animals with these signs to state and federal animal health officials. I'm Todd Domer. The U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has dismissed a lawsuit against Dicamba, this happening last week. However, that left open a door for the plaintiffs to expedite a new lawsuit in this new calendar year. The original lawsuit, which was filed by four farm and environmental groups in 2017, argued that the Environmental Protection Agency's 2016 registration of Extendamax for over-the-top use on soybean and cotton fields was unlawful when that registration Registration ended and EPA renewed the Dicamba registration last year. Monsanto, now Bayer, and EPA argued that the court should dismiss the lawsuit as moot. The court agreed, but the panel of judges also ruled that the plaintiffs, including the National Family Farm Coalition, should be allowed to fast track a new lawsuit based on the new 2018 Dicamba registration. An expedited schedule means that a process that often takes years can be compressed into a matter of months. That's according to an attorney for one of the plaintiffs, George Kimbrell, representing the Center for Food Safety. This makes it more likely that the court could issue a final decision on the legality of the Dicamba registrations here in 2019. Well, the passing of a farmer without a will or without properly structured farmland ownership 
can make life difficult for heirs. In many of those situations, the next generation owns the land as tenants in common, and if the owners can't agree on how to split the property, they can go to court for judgment allowing partition by sale. That's the preferred settlement method in 39 states. This forced sale obligates the family members who want to keep the farm to have the winning bid at a public auction on land that they partially own. Eleven states have created an alternative to this process by passing what's called the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, which allows the tenants in common to cash out an owner who wants to sell at an appraised value without having to put the entire property up for sale. It establishes a clear preference for a physical division of effort of heirs' property as opposed to a partition by sale, and it allows the court to consider factors such as heritage, historical or cultural value of the property in deciding how to partition the land. The new farm bill now gives states with such an act in place an additional boost. Frequently, land inherited this way lacks a clear title because not all of the fractional interest owners have been identified or have legally established. That's according to a professor at Texas A&M's University School of Law, Thomas Mitchell. That school drafted the farm bill provision. It now allows the owners of heirs' property, as defined under the act, to qualify for Farm Service Agency farm numbers and to be eligible for many different USDA programs, including lending and disaster relief programs. And the Farm Bill also gives producers who own heirs' property in these 11 states priority consideration for legal assistance to help them restructure their legal ownership for greater stability and obtain clear title to their property, noting that Iowa is the only Midwest or Plains state so far with this type of law in place. And Kansas State University has selected its new director of the Food Science Institute here at K-State, Jeanette Thurston, her name. She'll start duty in June. For the last 10 years, she has held positions at the USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture in the area of food safety. The Food Science Institute was established in 2001 to integrate the expertise in food science across the university. It facilitates undergraduate, graduate, and online education programs and provides both research and technical assistance to food industries. Thurston holds a Ph.D. in soil, water, and environmental science and microbiology, a master's in environmental science, and a bachelor's in microbiology, all from the University of Arizona. And for many years, she was a national program leader for food safety at NIFA, leading science programs and serving as a liaison to land-grant and other universities, national laboratories, industry partners, federal agencies, and other stakeholders. Again, Jeanette Thurston is to be the new director of the Food Science Institute here at Kansas State University starting this summer. Today's agricultural news headlines will return with more here on Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. When I looked again, he was gone, and one of the feeders was slowly swaying. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. He or she, it might have been the she as it was rather big, sat quietly near the tip of a low branch on the bur oak. It was a very strategic perch, being a very short distance from the feeder. Only the head was constantly turning, undoubtedly looking for early morning bird traffic to and from the feeders. I kept watching the hawk for quite a while, expecting it to dart away after prey, a bird visiting the feeder. I was thinking hard what to do, to chase the hawk away, 
or let nature take its course. Generally, I let nature do its thing. We all have to eat. However, it was the fact that the hawk had perched near the feeder that disturbed me. Undoubtedly a very smart hawk, but maybe too smart. The time that I watched, no birds visit the feeder, hanging close together. After a short time watching, I gave up, but every now and then I looked and saw the hawk was still sitting. By now, its stomach must have been growling. Then, when I looked again, he was gone, and one of the feeders was slowly swaying. Maybe that is when he got his meal. Maybe he missed on his dive, and the songbird escaped. All I could see was the one feeder slowly swaying while the others were hanging still. Looking up the profile of the sitting hawk, it was either a sharp shinned hawk or a cooper's hawk. They closely related species with similar markings. As the description goes, both can be found in towns during the winter, often snatching birds from feeders. The bird I was watching was, I think, the Cooper's hawk. I judged that on the size while sitting and its rounded long tail. They're great, darting flyers. If cedars are good enough habitat, then I have the right habitat as well as the open meadow. And as far as enough birds to choose, songbirds that is, we have them. The redbirds, the cardinals, the chickadees, on and on. We have them and they visit the feeders. Birds this hawk won't go after are the woodpecker, of which we also have different kinds. This is the time to really enjoy the feeders, though. Besides the feeders, the important part is habitat. The cedars grow on and off our hill are good habitat for this hawk. When it is nest building time around April, I plan to walk among the cedars and look. The telltales will be droppings and feathers near dense groves with trees near the edge of the grove. This is one season I like the evergreen, or should I say, red of the red cedars. It is what grows here as a grove. Besides habitat, I enjoy the winter scene when snow lies on the branches of the cedars. With the snow, the landscape lights up. With range pastures overgrown with cedars, you can see what I mean. But even on small scale in the backyard, the evergreen, the cedar, the canard cedar will make a show. And on cold, blustery days, they provide shelter for the birds. The spreading cedars out on the range concern me. It's rangeland gone to waste. But what does an old farmer do? It's like a friend reminded me with regard to the chainsaw I still use. Remember, he said, old men can easily cut their legs off. I know. But I'm still cutting my own wood and help friends. No time to get old. Being out in the woods later in the afternoon when the sun starts to go down is special. Suddenly, you feel it is getting colder again, and light on the trees reflects differently. The orange light of the sun going down shows on the smooth bark branches and gives a bright glow of the evergreens while making their shadowed parts even darker. It's a time of the day which can be either very silent quiet or busy to get feeding done. While your eyes are used to the falling light, you can switch on the tractor lights. But once you have done that, it's dark. You need the lights. A little earlier, the birds flew by to go to their roost for the night. Many years ago, my neighbor, who knew our farm quite well, came in the evening to pick up his good mule which had jumped the fence. I had caught the mule early in the day, grazing not far from the horses. The horses wanted little to do with it. Anyway, to make it easier to take home, I caught him, halted him and put him in the corral. When I picked up my friend, it was getting dark. 
By the time the mule was saddled, it was dark, and he rode out. But with his headlights shining the way, dark became darker. From a distance I could see he was losing his way. It was the time of the day that all was still, and sound carried far. The time of the evening and owl's hoot sound special. The time of the whippoorwill. I called out to him to go right, more right, and he would find the trail opening through the woods. The woods, all dark now, except for the searching beam like a firefly dancing on a warm summer evening. The time of the day that all daylight birds have found their roots or nests, depending on the time of the year. It always is a very special time of the day if you're in the right place. The right place. I don't know if the hawk I saw was in the right place. It all depends on your outlook. The fact is, the hawk needed a tree to perch on. Prairie grasses would not have done it. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. Our time's away for today. Thanks for listening in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.